Well, first of all, Michael, thank you. That was a, I think, in the 10 years I've been doing this, the most comprehensive, balanced, well-organized, and positive report that we've had uh, for the industry. I also want to compliment you. Last night at dinner, you told me you were going to take 42 minutes. You took 41 minutes and 30 seconds. So. <laughs> well done. You didn't get any bruises on your legs like past <laughs> presenters have. So let's, uh, let's kick this off now by asking the, the panel, uh, first of all, it was a very positive report, and I'll start with, with Ken. I'd just like you to reflect. Do you uh, agree with, with the positive aspects of this report, or are there things in here that scare you a little bit? Sure. So I came into this role um, April, May of last year, and I was in the e-commerce space for five years, and I was used to uh, uncertainty and dynamic changes, um, but coming back into this and understanding the pressures that were in the transportation industry really caught the shipping community a bit off guard, at least myself. Um, the report itself, I think it's fantastic, dead on, kind of like watching a, a bad movie again when you talked about <laughs> 18. Um, but some of the things that are, are a little concerning, you know, you had fuel listed as a tailwind. Uh, maybe so for the first part of the year uh, up to last week when the Iranians decided to blow up some oil tankers. So that's going to cause some, some uncertainty into the, the, the fuel and the oil industry. And then um, really, if you look at the investment that was made in driver wages last year across the industry, it had a positive impact, but it didn't have enough uh, impact to bring the number of drivers into the industry that we needed. I heard a figure of around 50,000. That's not enough. And then uh, with the, the lightning of demand, that kind of resolved the driver issue. But if I asked everybody in this room who has children to raise your hand and then keep it up if you uh, want your child to be a truck driver, um, there wouldn't be a lot of hands left. And you know, the millennials don't want to be uh, truck drivers. If you go into, sorry to go on a uh, kind of a, a topic here about driver uh, hiring and driver uh, attrition, but um, the age of our private fleet is about 57 years old, um, and that's, that's an issue, and I think that's uh, uh, common across the overall industry. If you want to go in the trades in high school, you go into a voc vocational training in high school, uh, the apprenticeship, and then by 21, you're a licensed plumber electrician. If you want to be a truck driver, uh, you can't even start till you're 21. So add immigration issues and all, some other pressures, but there is a deficit of drivers that I don't think was called out uh, to the level that it could be uh, in this report. And if the economy turns and demand uh, increases, um, I think we'll see the same problems we saw in 18. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll come back to the driver question a little mm -hmm. bit later. Jill, as a CPG manufacturer, does the report read positive to you, or is there something in here that scares you? Um, well, I think, it, again, it was very accurate and reflective of last year. Again, much like reliving a bad movie. I like that. I'm going to use that one again. Um, but what I found that was so interesting and hopeful is the relationship that shippers and carriers have going forward. Because we've been through all of these cycles where it's a shipper's market, it's a carrier's market. But it feels like after last year, we're truly coming together to collaborate. It's no longer, you know, you've got to reduce your rates. It's how can we work together to be more efficient so that both of us make decent margins. Wonderful. Mark? Yeah, I think uh, the report really bodes well for 3PLs like Penske Logistics. I mean, more and more shippers are turning to us to help them find innovative solutions to help them overcome some of the cost uh, pressures that they encountered last year and um, you know especially with transportation management network optimization etc but everything jill says everything ken says i totally agree driver shortage is still an issue and we do feel that uh, some of the shippers are starting to look at you know 3pls like us more as a partner because they realize some of the pain that we've been going through over the years with the increased cost, et cetera, and now they're willing to uh, give up a little bit more um, so that we can be more successful. Pretty good. Uh, Steve, there was a... I can't yeah. see you. <laughs> there was a, a fairly comprehensive section on rail. Uh, it was very positive, I thought, as well. Is this reflective of your business today? 
Well, I, I think overall I agree with what uh, what the prior comments have been about the report. I think from a from a rail perspective, uh, when I when I listen to it, and it's almost like looking in the mirror. Um, I, I think summarizing it, it, it seems like the story could have been reversed in terms of what the, the key takeaways were. If you look at the investment in capacity uh, that's going into the U.S. rail industry and the fact that the, the rail industry has the ability to do that, and then contrast that with the comments made about the, the state of our highway system, um, that probably didn't ring out uh, as loud. Uh, likewise, the investments in technology that improve safety, reliability, and the ability to provide uh, better uh, service consistency for our customers. I think that's a, that's a huge story. What stands out in here, and it's, it's because of the, the amount of uh, press it gets, is the, the focus on uh, the industry's cost performance. And, and I want to be really clear, being cost effective is critical to, to anyone in the rail industry. It, it is the predicate. Uh, you have to be cost effective to compete. You have to be cost effective so your customers can compete in their markets. Um, being cost effective is a very good thing, but it doesn't just stop there. Uh, certainly, cost effectiveness allows you to make the investments that enable um, a rail network to be sustainable. But beyond cost, you also have to be able to provide um, growth and innovation to allow our, our customers to, to compete in their supply chains and to allow ourselves to do, which, which we, we have a bias for growth, and we think that's the, that's the the tipping point for a virtuous cycle is growth enables further investment, which enables better capabilities, which enables growth. Thank you. Derek, any surprises in the report for you? No, I wouldn't say there's any surprises. I think it's very well put together. I think the data is compelling. Um, you know, we think the, the report speaks pretty well and holistically about what's going on in the industry. A, a couple of comments, though, that I would make is, um, you know, data is relevant and important, and it's, it's important that we take a look at, you know, logistics costs as a percent of GDP. But I think what gets lost a little bit is we act as if the supply chain of 18 was similar to the supply chain of 15 or 16, and we kind of are remiss if we don't think about, we're, we're somewhat comparing apples and oranges. I mean, as e-commerce continues to grow, as forward deployment becomes more of a reality, as people expect everything, including toilet paper, to be delivered next day, um, you are really having to do much more work, and the supply chain providers of this country are being stretched and expected to expand their portfolio in ways and at a pace that's really never been seen before. And so on one hand, yes, supply chain costs went up, and supply chain as a percent of GDP was a little higher, um, but it is a much more robust supply chain we're talking about. And in, even down to just very technical or, or tactical you know, thoughts around the number of times a product gets touched. With forward deployment, we go away from big regional super centers and huge intermodal hubs and huge operations with long length of haul, and we get to a place where you have import DCs feeding regional DCs, which then go to forward deployment centers, which then get touched again to take to your doorstep. And so I think somewhere in there, and I don't know how you do it, it's art, not science, because I don't think you should manipulate the data, and I think they did a great job of presenting the data, but there's a little more to it because we are being asked to do more than ever before, and that does come at a cost. And and just to uh, Steve's point, you know, what we have to do is find ways to be more and more efficient. You know, the other statement I'd make is there's a lot of rhetoric about what happened with rates on the uh, uh, carrier side and over the road side. And I said I would just you know caution people to remember that in 18, a once in a career, once in a lifetime kind of year from a rate environment in transportation. Uh, the aggregate or the average, if you will, of the publicly traded truckload community still made single digit margins. So with all of that rate relief, what they did is what they said they were gonna do. They invested back in drivers, they invested back in refreshing their fleets, and they put the money to work. Um, and so it isn't like they woke up in a world where all of a sudden they're running 75 ORs or, or making tons of money. They actually utilized the money to try to attract, train, and retain better drivers. They utilize the money to refresh the U.S. fleet um, in a significant way. Um, and so I'm sort of proud of, my, of the trucking brethren in terms of doing what they said they'd do. Um, we still have a very tight margin business uh, in trucking. Uh, if you think about the cost of capital for the average trucker, it's clearly north of 10 percent. It's probably more like 12 to 13 percent. And yet the average earnings of those same people are not covering the cost of capital. So we still have work to do, and we're going to have to continue to find ways to take waste out because, you know, the, the, the common theme is always, well, lower your cost structure. Well, if you look at a trucker, between trucks, trailers, fuel, 
um, drivers and tires, those five things are make, make up the vast predominance of their cost structure. And in all of those things, they have one thing in common, they're all in tight supply. There's a handful of truck OEMs, less than a handful of trailer OEMs. Um, there's a handful of tire OEMs. Um, it, it is not like leverage is on the side of the, the trucker when they're out trying to work to lower costs on a procurement basis. So where do we have to find it? We have to find it in operational efficiencies, optimization, you know, elimination of empty miles. It's hard work. It's, it's, it's penny by penny. Not, there's not big dollars or low-hanging fruit out there to be had. It appears you've given this some thought. I have a little passion for this, yeah. <laughs> I have a thousand questions, of course, but that's not the purpose of being here. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for our panel right now? Go ahead, please. Use the microphone if you would. Yes, uh, Sean Kilkar with the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. Um, talk about infrastructure, uh, the actual infrastructure, such as the highways, the ports, getting the freight, you know, via truck, via train, you know, via ships. How is the infrastructure going to play into this, uh, you know, faster, you know, delivering toilet paper overnight? How's this, how is infrastructure going to play a role in helping that all come together for you, for the different modes represented here? Okay, let, I think everybody probably has an opinion on this. Mark, could I ask you to comment first? Yeah, we'd like to see improvements in the roads. I mean, as we run down the roads and uh, go over potholes, et cetera, our maintenance costs go way up, and dependability of the vehicle goes down. Uh, drivers get uh, very frustrated with the conditions of the road, the congestion on the road because of uh, all the, the road work that's going on. I mean, we do need to take things further in uh, helping improve the infrastructure, specifically with roads and bridges. Derek, would you concur with that? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think infrastructure is an investment, not an expense. It's something that we need to take more serious as a country. It ought to be bipartisan. It generally is bipartisan, at least at the start of the dialogue. Um, but to do nothing is uh, the equivalent of not fixing your roof. I mean, if your roof is leaking, you fix it. Because not fixing it or not spending that money will cost you much more money long term. Infrastructure is the same thing. For us to sit idly and say, we don't have the money or we can't afford it, or we don't want to raise new revenues, um, it, to me, is short-sighted, because we will be spending much more money every year we let this go on. And Steve, the railroad industry pretty much funds its own infrastructure, but how would you reflect on these two? Well, I, 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 would, I would agree with the, the prior comments, and, and I'd add that historically, the United States has been in a uh, position where our infrastructure gives us a competitive advantage globally. And so, so we have that as an advantage, and uh, investment is needed to continue making that viable. I think there's two, two issues under that term investment. The first is uh, certainly from a rail perspective, modal equity is really important in, in the process of, of doing that. Uh, the, the user pay process has been uh, a way of giving us the balanced infrastructure we have today. And then the second issue, particularly from a rail standpoint, but also I think our customers experience it, Getting infrastructure expansion permitted has become a real challenge in this country. And it's not that permitting processes are bad. Permitting processes are appropriate and they should be followed. But oftentimes we find that, that permitting processes get used uh, for purposes where maybe a particular uh, viewpoint can't find legislative relief on their issue. And they go in and they, they, they use the, the local permitting process to uh, to engage on that, and I think that that's a real concern. We and our customers face that uh, frequently. Thank you, and Ken. I have to think this is something that you talk about in Bentonville. I don't don't tell us any secrets that we shouldn't know. But is, how how in your job, in what you're trying to do for Walmart, do you connect with government agencies, other organizations, in order to try to improve infrastructure? You know, we have a group here that uh, is part of government relations and affairs that, that works with both sides of the aisle. And I was in this town about 10 years ago, and we were spending an enormous amount of money that was supposed to be targeted towards infrastructure projects. And I don't think that realized the benefit that uh, everybody had hoped. And, uh, you know, you mentioned that competitive advantage that the U.S. has with the legacy Eisenhower system. But when you look at our ports and compare that to ports in Asia, they're at an incredible disadvantage. Uh, part of that is 
the, the regulatory oversight, um, the speed in which they can get projects moved and implemented and completed. Um, but we, we do, uh, obviously with our private fleet, we're, we're running the, the highways and the bridges that uh, across every state in this country and there's so many that are uh, in disrepair and need immediate attention and needed it, like I said, 10 years ago. We should probably have a separate session on just infrastructure sometime. Mm -hmm. Paul? Hi, um, Paul Page from the Wall Street Journal. Um, Ken and Jill, I wonder if you could address the, uh, uh, the fact that the um, pull forward in inventory has been very well documented over the past year. What impact has that had on your operations? And more, more importantly, um, what are, what's your forecast for this coming year and, and the impact of, uh, and the decisions you're making regarding the tariffs that are due to start uh, to rise again in the next couple of months uh, on the Trans-Pacific uh, lanes? Um, so we source about 40% of our product from uh, co-packers, and much of that comes from 15 different countries around the world. So last year with the impending 25% tariff from China, we participated in the surge of shipments and the buildup of inventory in the fourth quarter in anticipation of that. Um, and so we have a lot of inventory this year, and we have specific initiatives in place to reduce the amount of inventory that we have. Um, at the same time, we have um, been source looking for alternative sources other than China, and that's not an overnight solution in the food industry. Um, you have to qualify these locations and send your QA people there. And, um, and then, of course, you've got the long transit time coming in from if, if we're going to source from Thailand or whatever uh, country it is. So um, back to your question on inventory, though. Yes, we did have a significant buildup. We felt it. You know, our warehouses have felt it, our third-party warehouses, and we are um, actively trying to reduce that by... Does that mean shipping less? Um, Hopefully it means shipping more to our customers as they eat more of our uh, lovely canned seafood products and importing less. <laughs> so a combination of the two. Yeah, and I would say the same. We, we did uh, move ahead in, in some regards to the seasonal flows that uh, typically come later in the spring and in summer months. So inventory is, is uh, been increased in our import network uh, across uh, our five channels that, that we bring in merchandise from overseas. Uh, there was some channel changes to different countries where we could source and mitigate the uh, uh, the tariffs themselves. And and you know the last thing we want to do is absorb that cost. And the, the, really, the last thing we want to do is ever pass that on to a consumer. So we uh, uh, we moved it early. Christmas came early in some respects. Um, we, uh, we were out in the Port of LA, Long Beach in February, uh, late February, March, and it was really slow. Uh, so they had seen uh, operationally that impact. So it, it uh, rippled through the, uh, the supply chain because what comes in the ports goes into warehouses, goes into trucks. So uh, I think uh, March was, was uh, impacted by that at pull forward strategy. Really, it's a wait and see at this point, uh, see how all the tariffs shake out. Uh, there was some um, near sourcing to Mexico when, when China was only in play, and then it kind of went the other direction. Now that seems resolved. So there's so many things that are uncertain at this point. We're not quite sure what the plan's going to be going forward. OK. Let's, let me just give the other three panelists here an opportunity to talk about inventory if they like, Mark. As a 3PL, I mean, we just work with our shippers to help them reduce their inventories. So, okay. Is it affecting the rail business at all, Steve? I, I would say uh, we've seen, we've seen uh, less activity off the West Coast, and it appears that there's inventory um, driving some of that, uh, possibly the concern around tariffs uh, around the edges, the changes in the origin countries. You can start to see that shifting on the margins. Um, but there's a lot of other things that have gone on the first six months of this year particularly on our rail network, um, um, you know, weather. Uh, how, do you, how do you sort through how much was weather on our operations, how much is weather on our customers' operations, what's going on with overall demand? But certainly, we think there are inventory things that we're feeling in our shipment levels. And Derek, I'd ask you specifically, is inventory or excess inventory tying up rolling stock? Well, yeah, I, I would just say how we see it mostly is really the effect on balance in the network. So if you run a large national fleet, 
um, and you have pull forward activity, you're going to see perimeter pressure during the pull forward, meaning perimeter around the U.S. as people pull, pull forward, followed by now some domestic internal pressure with lack of ex uh, perimeter balance. So the coasts are less balanced, the interior now as you start to bleed down that inventory, where it shows up for carriers is a much higher cost structure. That lack of balance causes our costs to go up, it causes empty miles to go up, and so we're hopeful that we'll get through this as well. Very good. As but an industry. It, it should be noted, this is really a consumer problem, Paul. This, if people would just buy what we have instead of what they want, <laughs> this would really solve the entire issue. From the uh, Journal of Commerce, two questions on shipper of choice. Uh, first one, sort of two parts uh, for Ken and Jill, um, just discuss how, how you guys are shippers of choice and set yourself apart. And for Mark and Derek, um, it, talk a little bit about 12, you know, 12 months after sort of the discussion, everybody wants to be a shipper of choice. Have you guys seen the momentum stick, stick or do you see uh, shippers in general reverting to some bad habits now that, that the market softened a little. Good question, Jill. Shipper of choice. Okay. Um, well, we feel like we have been a shipper of choice for a while in the way that we partner with our carriers. Uh, we like to, again, partner over a long term with our carriers rather than continually bid our freight out year after year. So in that way, we try to work together with our partners on what lanes work for them. Um, and which ones they want to haul at a price that's competitive with the market. One thing that we have shifted that we heard from our carriers last year, so last year we stuck with our, our carriers and we paid extra money when we had to to, to get our loads hauled. Uh, for the most part, we're a smaller company, so we deal with, um, we contract with brokers. Um, so, but this, what we heard at the end of the last year was that they didn't really like the way we typically contracted, which is, at, we say, you know, we're gonna give you our business year round, and when typically, after you come off the fourth quarter and the first quarter is slow, we're gonna be there, we're not gonna give your freight away, but we want you to hold year round rates. Well, carriers were telling us that it was too uncertain. So this year, we've partnered with a few core carriers, and we basically do quarterly pricing, which we've never tried before, but um, it's working out for both of us because we're not asking them to build in that uncertainty of what's going to happen in the fourth quarter. So in that way, we feel that we're a shipper of choice because we listen to our carriers and the way that they want to price our business, and it's worked well for both of us. Uh, where we can control um, our shipments out of our plants, out of our manufacturing facilities, and out of our third-party warehouses, we do like to ensure that you know there are bathrooms and you know rest areas and places for the drivers uh, to relax. We hope to get them in and out in a timely fashion. Unfortunately, what we can't control is when these carriers deliver to our customers. So um, what we're trying to do in that regard is to actually work with our customers on ways to improve the turnaround with the carriers where we can. I'd ask Derek and Steve, how, on the opposite side of the coin, how do you define and search out shippers of choice? Well, so from our perspective, we measure a lot of things, but I think the last 12 to 18 months has really brought great clarity to it, uh, just like we want to be a carrier of choice. Um, last year, our behavior in the marketplace was different than many. Um, we did not take 20% of our fleet and put it in the spot market and chase what was really, really attractive rates. We stuck with our shippers. Um, we did take rate increases that were necessary. Um, our rates did not go up in, in excess of anything that the industry was seeing, and in most cases was significantly below that. Um, and, and we stuck by their side, and we've seen them reciprocate this, this year. Um, working on a longer term plan, obviously they're cognizant of what's going on with the rate environment, but if we stuck with somebody throughout 18 and picked up and delivered on time and met our expectations, we're going to work with them and hope that they're going to do the same thing in reverse, and by and large they are. Uh, the one comment on shipper of choice I would make is that, you know, I think electronic logs had a whole lot more to, to, to do with that than anything in the rate environment or otherwise, because with electronic logs what happened was we've, we've delivered 19 billion miles on electronic logs. We're the first carrier in America to go to fully electronic logs. We're the first one approved by the Department of Transportation to make it the log of record. Um, and what happened when we made the conversion to electronic logs is, for the first time really in our industry's history, the time on the outside of the dock counted the same as the time inside the walls. 
uh, because miraculously they always, not, not purposefully, but subconsciously, that driver's time was never valued the same as the forklift or the forklift driver or the person in the warehouse. And now it is. And so it's elevated the dialogue. And I think shippers have been remarkable in their interest in being efficient and working with their carriers. And I think carriers have better data. And the fact is trucks have wheels and they'll move to shippers that are efficient and committed and away from those that are not. And, and that's certainly what our focus is, is try to work with and be a part of the most efficient supply chains in America that we can attach ourselves to, and, and it's working. Steve? I think Derek said it right. The, the, the efficiency of the supply chain across time will we'll sort that out. Um, you know, we want to work with all of our customers to ensure that our product and our customers, in many cases, our largest business is, is moving trucks on our railroad, so our customers are trucking companies. Um, we want to make sure that we can integrate ourselves into our customers and our customers' customers' supply chains so that they have information to manage it. The, the reality of it is it takes information. In many cases, uh, we have customers who are shipping uh, something into the network seven days a week. We're operating seven days a week, but they're maybe receiving five days a week. So how do we work with our customers to, to get both the efficiency and the capacity that comes from working together to smooth that out? Um, there were a few, though, that we just couldn't come to terms with, and quite frankly, we did have to part ways. But uh, it has allowed us to be a little bit more selective who we deal with. And as Jill said, it's important to have that partnership, a true partnership relationship. We own a truck, uh, a regional truckload carrier um, called EPS, and uh, they've been able to be a little bit more selective on what shippers they're dealing with. So I think it bodes well for their business. But ultimately, we want to be able to service our customers. We do not like to walk away from a customer. Everybody wants to do business with Walmart. <laughs> not everybody. Not everybody. <laughs> Until they do business with Walmart, maybe. But, so how this, this shipper of choice, customer of choice, how do you deal with that? How do you talk so, about it? So I'm proud of the fact that we were ranked number three in the uh, survey that just came out. And uh, like Jill, we were a had a shipper of choice program for, for years, uh, over a decade. Um, but this past year, it really intensified on the driver. So the driver has 660 minutes to drive legally per day. And anything that we may do that impacts that is perceived as a negative uh, experience to the driver. So we wanted to um, dissect every milestone that that driver has on our property, whether it's coming or going, and really found some waste. And um, uh, just, I'll give you one example. So in our perishable network, if there was product that did not meet our specs, we, while waiting for disposition, we would keep that driver at our dock, whether we're going to ship it back to the vendor, whether they're going to throw it out, or whatever the case may be. Uh, the driver, in many cases, did nothing and kept it at the right temperature throughout his journey. Um, so we've changed our process. We unload it, put it in a containment area, and let that driver go on his way. So that in itself um, really changed on the temperature control side of the business, uh, the carriers uh, and the company and the driver's receptiveness to, to hauling from Walmart, where in the, the past they may not want to go to a DC because it was uh, a negative experience. So we looked at a lot of different areas, and you know, there's always the the how do you pay your claims rates and you know do you let your drivers use the break rooms and things like that but really the focus was on utilization of the driver this year and um, we did a lot of nice things and I think the, the drivers saw the benefit. Okay. All right, does that help? So can, can I add one thing to that? Uh, just going back to Joe's comment, I just, sometimes these events come out with and you walk away from them there's these headlines around quarterly pricing or or whatever i i applaud jill because first off she said the most important thing which was after meeting with her carriers and listening to her carriers they decided that in their environment this was the best situation which is far from saying it's some sort of one size fits all solution because just as we might be extremely amenable to quarterly pricing with a company like jill's we might want to book in that with a company like ken's with a multi-year pricing proposal proposal and both of those are the right answer like there's not a single bullet or single answer that fits everyone if we're really going to collaborate then by definition it's going to be different shipper to shipper carrier to carrier depending on the situation so I just want to clarify Mark and, and Derek it sounds like you're saying there's no you haven't noticed any sort of bad habits creeping back in in any significant way now that things are not as tight as it was a year ago by and large with your customers 
Well, when you put the by and large part at the end, I'd agree with it. <laughs> um, look, we, we have heat maps and we do efficiency measurements both by vertical, so by industry vertical as well as geographic region. We, we know and measure very, very finitely what's happening with our assets and where they're detained and where they start to, to lose some of those 660 minutes that Ken talked about. And certainly there are some that, that are maybe not putting as much attention in that area as they once did. And again, that's a first discussion, hopefully a resolution, and absent of a resolution, then we have to move all of those assets to places that they can be better utilized. Yeah, for us, I mean you're not going to go back to a driver and ask for wages, a wage reduction. We're not going to lower our equipment costs, so it is out there. We're very reluctant to take a step backwards. Okay. Please. Hi, I'm Susan Lacefield with Supply Chain Quarterly. Um, I have a question just about the U U.S. business logistics cost as a metric. Um, as I understand it, when it was original, the first time the report was issued, it was a way of looking at logistics efficiency, uh, especially in comparison to post-deregulation? And is, is U.S. physics logistics cost still, a, as, as a measurement of GDP, still a good way to look at logistics efficiency? Or is that no longer um, useful? Michael, this one's to you. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Susan, I think one thing's for certain, it's, it's a trigger for a conversation. Um, it allows you know, the, the conversation to start and then you start asking the questions, well, what drove it? So, uh, you know, you start getting into, well, what happened with inventory? What happened with motor carriers? So um, I think it's really how you pursue the conversation, how you look into, how you investigate what the causes were of that move. Uh, I think no one will contest that, um, you know, last year was a highly inflationary year and, and the USBLC numbers uh, supported that. Uh, interestingly, uh, prior year GDP numbers were res revised up and, and what looked like an increase a few years ago actually wound up being flat. So, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, the numbers are, uh, can be challenging to interpret or reinterpret, but I think the, the important point is, is to start diving into the details. The example on inventory that came up, Paul asked about it. Um, you know, is there going to be a, a big drawdown in inventory which would lower shipments which might impact GDP? If you look back at the uh, business logistics costs, you see that inventory uh, management has improved. So the inventory to sales ratio has dropped since 2016 and it only spiked up at the end of the year for the reasons that we discuss. So we can expect that because supply chains have become more sophisticated in the way that they handle inventory that that number is going to creep back down to the one point three nine one point three six and lower number so it's it's to have that conversation so this is a little bit off topic because this is the north american report but how would you contrast that to uh say europe or asia right so um we do keep an eye on uh, those markets as well we work with with shippers and carriers in both of those spaces um europe went through a, a highly inflationary period um, not not as severe as in the United States, but um, costs definitely went up in Europe uh, last year as the economies performed relatively well. And similarly, and, and I think uh, Mario Draghi just uh, hinted that they might be lowering rates, Europe has been slowing down this year and capacity has loosened up, uh, rates have started to drop and, and uh, uh, economic growth has uh, slowed on the European continent. Um, in Asia, it's, it's been a story of, of rapid growth. Um, you know, those economies, uh, you know, are growing at, at three and a half to, to seven percent if you look at the, the historical China numbers. So what they've been able to do, sometimes directed by governments, uh, as the case is with China, is, is to get ahead of growth and build out infrastructure and make investments. And very often, um, logistics capacity, for example, in the shipping industry is part of, of uh, government jobs programs. You could go that as far as to say that is, you know, investing in capacity is, is part of a national strategy of supporting certain industries. So we've seen a lot of growth in capacity uh, and demand in the Asia market. Thank you. Yes, sir. Bill Cassidy from the Journal of Commerce. A question for everybody. When working with your partners of choice, Maybe that's the term we should begin to use. Okay. Uh, when you're looking for the efficiencies that you mentioned and, and you also talked about, what are the, the efficiencies that you uh, are really looking for 
this year and going forward? What areas do you see where we can gain real efficiency that we should be focusing on? And the second part of that is, you know, what are the obstacles that you see towards greater collaboration with, with your logistics partners? Okay, let's start with Steve and work our way north. Okay, um, that, that's, a, that's a complex question. There are a lot of moving parts. If, if I look across what it means for, for BNSF, the, the answers will be a little bit different uh, by how you look at what supply chain we're serving. So if you're talking about our, our coal business where they are in a, a real uh, you know, dogfight, if you will, for, for position in the electricity generation stack, it's all about what do you do to help them take out costs? What do you do about ensuring that you're, you're hitting, hitting the bus bar at the lowest cost per, per megawatt hour and, and what's our role in helping do that? So it's a very laser focus on, on having a, a sustainable cost structure. If you're talking about our intermodal business, which is I think what the majority of the conversation today here has circled around, it, it's, about, it's about for the driver, it's about the driver experience at our intermodal facilities. How do we use technology like our rail pass application to enable drivers to take time out? So we've seen with the drivers who are using it after the first 18 months, their typical in-gate experience has been uh, about 10 to 15 percent shorter. If you just add up those minutes across every driver that comes in and out of our facilities, it gets to be a big number. Now the next challenge is how do we integrate that with our customers' in-cab systems so it's not a separate app, if you will. And, and that's what we'll be working on as, as we move forward. I, I, think, um, I think what we can do is work with our beneficial cargo owners for how do we reduce dwell at our intermodal facilities. Because again, uh, the opportunity to create more capacity and more efficiency, both turn times on the containers as well as capacity in the facilities. How do we work together to, to reduce that dwell and, and make sure that we're providing in transit visibility and predictability so that people can plan that container's time at the, at the destination door? And then I think it's about working with our shipping customers for them to be able to inject into our systems so that we know when they want to take a container out of our network and take it to a door so we can manage its flow across our network as opposed to today we're kind of a first in first out system you know if you're if you're coming into our, our a truckload facility it's kind of first in first out well we know every every container doesn't have the same in want date how do we put that as part of our planning for how we load the train how we unload the train just a couple examples. You spoke eloquently to this already, but do you have anything to add? I don't know if I've ever spoke eloquently, but well, I think I'll did. take it. Um, yeah, I mean, so for us, I think it's all about um, working with partners that are willing to play a role in mitigating risks for us. Um, we're there every day trying to mitigate their risks and make sure things are on time, on you know, in full, on the shelf, and working and knowing that we have partners that care as much about those same risk mitigations for us. And so what does that look like? It looks like you know, the ability to be able to count on a set of freight for some sustainable period of time so we can build network efficiency around it. One of the biggest risks I think that 19 represents is with spot market rates being as low as they are, at least earlier in the year, you start to see an increase in bid activity and increase in volatility. And when you do that, you inherently see lower rates at a time your costs go up because of the very volatility of all of these rebids. And so people that, that means more to us are those that take a more cautious approach and understand that while we, we get that they need lowest landed delivered cost and we're gonna work to make that happen for them, um, we need to do it with transparency and visibility into the future. And we need to know that if we build a network around certain lanes, those lanes have some stickiness in our network. Because if they don't, and we're constantly through this evolution, um, it really is disruptive and causes a lot of pain. Uh, we've seen large bids whereby the renewal might come out the other end with rates being up in 19 and even volume being up, but the turnover within the bid was 70%. That's extremely difficult on a person's network. It causes all kinds of downstream effects on service to surrounding customers, inefficiencies, increased empty miles. It, th to the extent we can work together to not let that happen, I think it's a win for both sides over time. Maybe not that bid that quarter, but over time it's a good thing. Thank you. Uh, before we move to the next question, I just want to make sure that that these three panelists have an opportunity to, to speak to this partner of choice? So for us, it's really, it gets down to trust, right? You've got to make sure that you have trust between the two partners and transparency and that you're working and, you know, you have an established goal, you understand the goal and you work together to uh, achieve that goal. And once you have that, I think it really goes a long way. And then you can help the customer, you know, look at their overall network 
be very transparent in what you see, what they're trying to achieve, and then march to towards that goal. Whether it be commingling freight to lower cost, um, it's just, you know, you've got to have that trust. And for us, when we have that trust with our partners, it goes such a long way, and you can really just work closely together and uh, achieve great things. Okay. Jill or Ken, briefly. Um, I'm going to change uh, from talking about transportation to talking about our logistics partners, as in the third-party warehouses. Um, we have a, a few number of third-party warehouses, regional warehouses, and what we've done to partner most recently um, in light of the increasing wages and, you know, it's so hard to get warehouse laborers, uh, we actually went to a cost plus model with one of our major warehouse providers. Um, and in that way, what we did was we made sure that they're making a good margin and that they're actually able to hire at a competitive price the labor that they need, uh, which is working out really well for us. I mean, we're seeing what the employees are being paid. Um, we're seeing their productivity numbers. And again, it's, it's a shared partnership. So we're working together to make sure that we're getting the labor that we need, that they're paid fairly, um, and that they're actually um, storing and handling our, our product accordingly. The one thing that wasn't mentioned is a provider that's multifunctional. So we have many different needs throughout our supply chain network. And like Derek's uh, company serves four of those channels. So it gives us the ability, as he mentioned, ebbs and flows in the portfolio and the top line revenue that they get from Walmart that we can move around with that portfolio if they help us in intermodal and dedicated and in brokerage and other aspects that um, if it's just a, a single provider with, with one service, it's more difficult. Paul, thank you for your patience. Yeah, the, um, the report mentions uh, that a lot of uh, companies were talking on, on their investor calls and, and about logistics and freight costs. And, uh, you know, I heard some, I remember listening to the Halliburton call and they, they sounded traumatized, <laughs> frankly, by 20% freight cost increases. What were the most um, difficult conversations or what was the most trying conversation you had with your CFOs or CEOs uh, about those costs early, I guess in the first quarter is really when they started to shoot up. Uh, how, did, how did that conversation go and, and what are you talking to them about now? Jill, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it really, no, I know it really helped with all of the articles out there in the Wall Street Journal and the other publications, you know, of Hershey's and their earnings call and schmuckers and everybody talking about it. So what we did proactively was, you know, get in front of the CEO and, and show these articles and explain what was going on. Um, at the same time that we had the rising transportation and warehousing costs, we also had commodity cost increases. Um, the majority of our cost is fish and the cost of fish was going up. So. Unfortunately for the consumer, what it meant was that we all had to get together and take a price increase, but we were able to justify the reasons. It wasn't just, you know, we want to increase our margins. It was all of our costs are going up, and this is where they're going up, the cost of steel for our cans. So I guess to answer your question, we just, right at the first quarter, uh, showed the examples of all the other companies. So it wasn't just, oh, Jill's saying that her transportation costs are going up this year. You know, it was the whole industry. So before we deal with the, with the top down from Derek and, and Mark, how about Walmart? Do you have these conversations with your CFO? Uh, well, we have a, a weekly officers meeting in uh, my first couple of weeks. Uh, in the role, I didn't realize why anybody wouldn't sit next to me. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was being called out on a, on a weekly, monthly basis as we saw the impact. And um, to Jill's point, we became more or less consultants to help explain what was going on in the industry, what the impact was to our private fleet. Um, also, our merchandise is both prepaid and collect. So while we were feeling the pressures, the vendors were feeling the pressures coming to our merchants. So we helped them better understand what the true cost was and what the true impact was. So uh, we worked through it. It was, it was difficult. And uh, I think a few of our earnings uh, announcements had some footnotes, but uh, related to supply chain cost. And, costs have been so um, stable for mm -hmm. like 20 years. Right. I mean, did, did you have difficulty convincing? I mean, they must have looked at you and said, Ken, you did something wrong. Yes. Uh, <laughs> have we had some of those? <laughs> uh, 
uh, you know, again, new enroll, it was you know quite uh, quite the immediate impact. So um, it was it was really there were so many things that we could touch from a data point in the industry that mm -hmm. that helped tell the story, and it was consistent when other retailers and other parts of um, the supply chain industry were all um, speaking with the same voice. So uh, it's one of those things we we recovered, we got through it. Uh, we grew a private fleet by 1,300 drivers to help combat some of our um, high cost lanes. Um, we went into this year more realistic to what we thought the year would be. And, and uh, right now it's, it's, uh, those conversations are, are much less. Steve, with all of the areas you're responsible for, you must have an active conversation with the CFO on a regular basis. How does that shape up for the railroad industry? Boy, um, I, I probably won't comment for the industry on, on, on that particular okay. question, but for, for BNSF, uh, our conversations with our CFO is, is around what are we doing to ensure that, that we have a growth pipeline, and what does that look like over the next three to five years, and then uh, behind that, um, what are the opportunities to ensure that we're, we're enabling that growth pipeline through the judicious application of, of either um, capital to build infrastructure or non-capital ways to, to better improve our, our um, productive use of the infra in existing infrastructure that we've got. So that, I, I would say those are, the, those are the biggest conversations that we have. Okay. And then Derek and Mark, you're getting the bubble up from the CFO, right. and then I'm sure giving them input down. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll answer it a little bit different, more on the shipper side CFO from this perspective. So Ken mentioned earlier about wanting suppliers that, that bring them value across to multiple of products or multitude of products. We take that very seriously. But one of those products that we talk to our shippers about all the time, in 18 it certainly got used a lot, was the ability for us to come in and tell our own story to their CFO or their CEO. Because what happens inherently is these logistics professionals, they know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about, but they don't necessarily want to hear what their own team is telling them about what's happening in transportation. So, And by inherently them trying to message that to their CFO or CEO, they often come off as maybe defending their supplier base too much. And so we pushed out a, a message early in the year saying, listen, book us. We would love to come in, and we will meet directly with your C-suite. And they can challenge us and question us and probe us. Um, on all of these issues that they really are skeptical about. And we found great value in that last year. And so in, in, in both ways, by the way, we got to understand more what was keeping them up at night and why and how it affected their end product. And we took that very seriously, but we were able to make our case directly to them on why costs were what they were, what was happening, what cost of capital in the industry looked like, what average earnings in the industry looked like, and, and why the industry needed this level of investment in wages and, and equipment. That was the two major things that needed to be invested in. And so that was something that we hope to continue, and we hope to continue to support our supply chain partners with their you know, senior leadership whenever possible. Mark, take us home. Yeah, I echo what uh, Derek said. We took a similar approach, and we met with our shippers because we were under tremendous margin pressures. Our CEO and our founder was like, you know, your product uh, margins are so low, we need to go in and we can no longer absorb these increases, so you've got to go talk to your shippers. So we took a very similar approach, a very transparent approach, sat down with our customers, showed them open books, this is where we are, this is what we're paying our drivers, this is what our equipment's costing. So you see our margins are eroding, we have no choice but to ask for increases. Helpful. All right, we had a question from Ari, and then we have a question back here. I'll get to you in a second, okay? Ari first. I wanted to shift the discussion to truck versus intermodal. Uh, one of the things that uh, Michael mentioned about halfway through his presentation uh, was the, the shift in, in that miles where rail conversion uh, may go and that it may go up and, and the digitization you were referring to uh, in the trucking space. I'd like to hear everybody's opinion on the, the future of intermodal um, a, knowing that price points have gotten a lot tighter between truck and intermodal these days, and B, not just, you know, we know markets will turn, but the digitization is certainly going to affect pricing uh, in the long run in trucking. So where do you see intermodal in the next 10 years or so? Okay. Does it, where, what's its role long term? All right. Where do you see intermodal in the next 10 years, Ken? <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a critical uh, part of our supply chain network. Uh, we. Uh, have a significant amount of revenue that, that uh, flows across the four, uh, five class ones. 
Um, we took a step last year, going back to your question about what did we do about some of the cost impacts that we were uh, being uh, presented with, and we launched our own intermodal fleet. Uh, we did that as a test. Uh, we were being brought double-digit rate increases from our IMC providers, and also we looked at it from a service uh, standpoint. The precision rail networks are, are great. Uh, sometimes that leaves a few folks uh, in a situation where you can't have the service that you need. Um, also, our, our precision on interlined uh, across the country, so Southern California to Florida, we were seeing a lot of variability because our carrier partners picked it up when they needed to versus when it needed to get to the rail ramp. And so we looked at um, intermodal as an opportunity to uh, combat the driver shortage, increase uh, Walmart uh, uh, self-reliance, frankly, and also uh, the dependability on the shelf of our merchandise. So uh, my internal customer, they care about uh, one thing. It's called Asuka on shelf, customer available. Um, everything else really doesn't matter to them if they can't sell anything on the shelf. And when you have, you know, three to four day variability in your your lanes on intermodal, um, that's a problem. And so we took some action to help prevent that. But it's it's uh, core network uh, uh, competency uh, for Walmart. We need intermodal. It helps uh, in many different areas, and I think it's going to be um, it continued important to us going forward. Thank you. Fundamental shift. With, with technology, you know, driverless truck. No, you know, obviously the costs in trucking with technology seem to be going. Well, let's ask that question to Steve because I'm going to bet you're bullish on intermodal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should take that as an over. Um, we, we we clearly are bullish about uh, intermodal. It's uh, it's our largest business. It's it's historically um, been our fastest growing business, and and we think it is a source of growth going forward. Now, all that said, we we also uh, recognize that that. The intermodal that was and is probably needs to be the different in the future. And part of that means we need to better integrate within the supply chain so we can help drive out variability. There's no question that there's there's variability there that we can improve upon. Um, we, we also see the opportunity to bring technology into our operation. And I talked earlier about the technology uh, relative to safety and reliability. As we, as we utilize all the all of the machines that are on our network that look at every rail car that passes by them, um, historically those have been used to generate alarms and say something's out of tolerance. Now we're starting to stitch those machines together and so we look at a reading of a rail car wheel or axle multiple times over a month across multiple detectors. So how hot is it? How does it sound? What does it look like? And then combine artificial intelligence to start, it's, instead of responding to something that's out of tolerance, I'm predicting when it's going to be out of tolerance. And doing the same thing for our, our, our rail geometry. Instead of responding to rail geometry that needs uh, uh, some specialized attention, actually going out and saying the trend here says this particular area of the railroad, you need to do something out of your maintenance plan because it's trending in a way that, that doesn't look right. So those things all move towards enhancing our reliability. Certainly, we will change our intermodal facilities from what they are today to, to what they're going to be. Um, we're going to have to handle more volume uh, faster. We're going to have to handle more volume um, more reliably with, with less, with less uh, inconsistency. And, and part of that is, again, the integration because our, our facilities operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and we have to match that up against a, a receiving facility that might operate 12 hours a day, five days a week. Thank you. Comment. So I don't want you all to think that was a railroad issue. In many cases, that was self-inflicted by Walmart. So if you think about loading priority in a Southern California warehouse, uh, in many cases, we were loading a regional warehouse prior to a Florida destination, yet the railroad scheduled train is leaving in three hours. So we flipped and used some technology, it's called real-time trailer visibility, to understand this trailer needs to load if you backwards plan from the dray to the end gate to the unloading of the, of the container. So we enabled that in our Southern California warehouses and immediately saw some improvement in the precision of how we operated, not necessarily how the railroad operated. Thank you. Thank you for being patient as well. Thank you. Uh, Matt Leonard with Supply Chain Dive. Um, 
I was curious about one thing the report touched on briefly, which is the Uberization of freight. Um, Derek, I was wondering if you had any thoughts when it comes to things like Convoy and Uber Freight and even Amazon getting into this space potentially. And uh, Jill and Ken, have you guys found any uh, um, ways to use this technology in your businesses as far as uh, procuring freight? So I, I believe the question is to Derek and to Jill on Uberization. Okay. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> first off, I, I think this, this, the starting point of the conversation has to be when we talk about digitization or the uberization of freight and what's going on with technology, somehow it always starts with this sort of inherent belief that the incumbent players in this industry are not spending money and investing heavily in the same area. So as we think about our brokerage business, you know, our logistics business this year will be over $600 million in revenue and growing um, you know, over the last couple of years, 10% or greater every year. Um, and last year was 20% plus. Um, and so we're putting our money in the same place as they are. And, and, and so we are looking at making you know, uh, automated freight matching a reality within our network. We're looking at applying the same sort of machine learning uh, to how we think about capacity procurement, capacity aggregation, and then ultimately dispatch and, and track and trace. And it's working. And so I think these companies are real. They're quality companies. I'm not going to say anything negative about them. But I think when people think about disintermediating truck brokerage, and they compare it to taxis in the taxi industry, it's a very big leap of faith to make that analogy. Because in taxis, when they disintermediated taxis, you had an inefficient industry with antiquated regulatory kind of environments and really lots of opportunity to take waste out of the system versus a mature brokerage industry that's been around a long time that operates on pretty slim margins. And on average, those margins, you know, from, a, from an operating perspective are four to six percent net and gross margins are call it 12 to 14. Um, and so there's not as much to work with. Secondarily, in the taxi market, when you went and disintermediate that, the freight loads itself and unloads itself out of the conveyance. <laughs> and, and that's not really the business we're in. And the conveyance takes some directionally accurate look like what you said yes to on your phone, but it's not exactly what you said yes to. And Excel has a lot of definitions, evidently. Um, black car means you know something vaguely darker than white. Um, and so. In our business, 102 means 102. 53 foot long means 53. The ability to put 26 pallets in a place and do it appropriately and efficiently means doing exactly that. And so I think it's a blended solution between increased investment in technology as well as um, the human you know, know-how that we've developed over, you know, in our case, six decades of experience in this space. So we say bring it on. We, want, we think competition is good for the marketplace, um, but we're going to continue to invest in our own business, invest in our own tech, and we like our chances just fine of competing head-to-head -head over time. Jill, does the concept of Uberization play into your strategy? Uh, we, have, we have talked to Uber, but we have not done any business with Uber. So we are very similar and depending upon our carriers to use the technology, our partner carriers. The last comment, can I, I want to jump on one more thing, sorry. But the other difference is if you're a shipper in America and you're trying to make sure you can count on capacity long term, the idea of supporting your carriers and their brokerage arms and their logistics arms so that that profit that's made in those logistics arms goes back into physical trucks and trailers means something. It's kind of that circle that Steve was talking about within the rail, but that's the circle for us, is those profits become CapEx in the coming year and they show up and manifest as actual trucks and trailers and drivers and, and conveyances. And so we really appreciate shippers like Jill and others that, that understand that we need to be competitive as a broker and we've got to give them a solution that's every bit as economically feasible, but out of those profits and margins that are garnered through that work, we're able to then reinvest in physical assets that move freight because there is no digitization of that yet. I mean, freight still gets moved in trucks and trailers and rail cars and intermodal. Having said that, does Uberization play into the strategy at Walmart? Uh, our relationship with Uber was limited to our store delivery, um, our customer delivery from ship from store. Uh, we have not shipped anything with Uber. I, I don't think the transformation that they saw in the, the ride share, sharing is going to replicate itself in the, in the trucking space. Okay, thank you. Bob, I believe you have a question. Yes, I'm Bob Murray. I teach at Ryder University, and one of our major research projects last year was blockchain. Uh, and while I hear all of you talking about two relationships, primarily shipper and carrier, 
uh, primarily supplier and producer and things like that. Blockchain mandates that everybody comes to the table, including the financial institution, and everybody has to agree on specifics. How do you see blockchain? Are any of you doing anything with blockchain? Are you looking at it? And, and how do you see that kind of relationship where all parties has to come to the same table at the same time? Anybody doing anything with blockchain right now? Well, we certainly, uh, we certainly are, are part of a consortium that's, that's looking at how do you practically apply uh, blockchain to uh, the shipping industry. You, you know, the, the, the example that was in here was about the Maersk uh, activity. We're, we're part of the same consortium that, that they're part of. Um, so I would say it's in the very early stages. There certainly is value to having um, a single source of truth about a shipment, and you can have all the, uh, the certified parties that should have access to that information known and, and visible. If you look at today what we do to a, a bill of lading so that all the various parties can do track and trace, it, it, it gets to be a little bit populated in that bill of lading, making sure that everybody that should look at it can. Uh, so certainly, certainly there are advantages that blockchain brings. And, and I'm a layperson. I'm, I'm sitting outside the technology sphere. Um, just the, the computational overhead costs of trying to get all of that distributed across the network, I, I think the practical application, we're going to have to see how that, how that works, right? How do, you, how do you get all of that computational cost and all of that communications tying all those parties together? We have to see that practically work. Jill, can we find seafood in the blockchain? You can. Uh, we have implemented blockchain. We've partnered with SAP, and but maybe not in the way that you guys are thinking about blockchain all the way through to our transportation and uh, providers and warehouses. But we've partnered with SAP so that um, we know where the fish was caught. We know what ocean it was caught in, where it was processed, you can see um, the microbiological testing that went on, that it passed all the tests, and a QR code is applied to the package so that when it shows up at the consumer, they can see all of that. They can see that it was caught in a fair trade um, environment, you know, and in some cases they can see one of the fishermen that may have caught it. So we have just begun this year to implement blockchain. But again, it's not all the way through to it's on this uh, transportation provider and it stopped in this warehouse. It's basically where the fish was um, sustainably caught. I think the report talks to the idea of partner scale here. And it probably when we have the same conversation in a couple of years, it's probably going to be a very different environment than we have right now. Questions? David. Uh, I would like to gauge. Uh, to what degree are you concerned about some of the regulatory challenges to the independent contractor model in trucking and parcel delivery, particularly in California, but it's also taking place in other states and jurisdictions? Mark, for a 3PL, we're very concerned about it. We follow it. Uh, I, I probably have weekly discussions with our general, con, uh, general uh, counsel on the latest developments and the rulings and all that because we do use some uh, independent carriers to handle some of our loads in California. And uh, we want to make sure that we're going to minimize our exposure. So big, big ramifications on the industry, I think. Very concerned. Derek, big effect on your business? Yeah, I mean, we're extremely concerned would be the answer. And we've essentially ended our owner-operator independent contractor model completely in California. Um, it represents less than 10% of our fleet overall. Um, and I think it's a shame because if you look at most of the companies out there that, that utilize an uh, owner-operator model or IC model, it's really because drivers have aspirations to become business owners over time. And the vast majority of the folks that are in those roles at large carriers started as a company driver and want to own their own truck and want to kind of develop and have career development opportunities. But with the constraints that have been placed on it and the, the increased focus uh, and the number of sort of tripwires that exist that no matter how hard you try to do it right, it's difficult to sort of land that plane. Um, we have made the decision, regrettably, um, for our drivers 
to have to minimize that exposure. And so what used to be 10% is now 8% and it'll soon probably be 6 or 7% of our fleet. And it is not a point of emphasis going forward simply because the regulations are becoming way too burdensome. And, 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 and they're intended to address a very, very small subset of the industry that was doing it incorrectly or, or you know, in a way that really should have been reined in. But the vast majority of the industry is trying to do the right thing by the driver and do it the right way, and we are certainly one of them. And the ramifications are elsewhere besides just truck drivers, right? Um, look at all the technology companies that hire people to come in and do programming for them, et cetera, help workers. I mean, it's, it's going to be big. Hi, John Gallagher with Freightways. And just to follow up on the, the, the regulatory uh, question, is there anything, I mean, aside from the specific regulations that affect, say, trucking and rail, uh, uh, you know, the demergent and, and detention that's being looked at in, in rail and the, um, the ELD mandate in, in trucking, is there, is there anything else, like, from a regulatory perspective that might cut across all the modes, maybe from a technology communications perspective that you guys might be following that might, that, that's not necessarily specific to your mode, but which is, is concerning to you as these technology changes move ahead uh, uh, going forward with, with any of you wondering if that comes to mind. Yeah, you know, sort of opinion on that? Broad brush stroke impending legislation. I'm not aware of any. Maybe I didn't understand the question. Y yeah, well, just as an example, um, regulations that might affect telecommunications as, as you guys pl plan to be more proactive in, um, in, in, fr in freight location, for example. Is there anything like that that you guys are following that might be under the radar? I can't think of anything. I don't have any secrets. Can you think of something? <laughs> <laughs> so I was asking you. This is your bailiwick, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to hear if there was anything you guys were following, so. If, but if okay. you are aware of something, you yeah. should be aware. Yeah. Please tell us. <laughs> All right, we have about 10 minutes left. I, I want to ask a, a question of the panel, and you're welcome to just tell me you don't want to answer it if you don't want to. But, you know, we're in the ninth year of a 10 year recovery right now. Since the late 1700s, we've gone through a, some sort of correction recession every 10 years or so. What are we doing in the supply chain industry to hedge? against the next correction? What are, are we going to be better off this time than we were the last time? I'll start with Ken. Yeah, I'm not an economist, but, um, you know, really the, the things that we've been working on, um, the, the processes, the improvements, they work in a recessionary environment or an expansion environment. So uh, we've had some, some leadership changes and, and came with a, a zero loss mindset where Two years ago at this time, we were looking to build about four new distribution centers based on the, uh, the throughput uh, capability. And, you know, if we were at 70 percent, they were trying to get to 75, and he flipped it and said, we're at 100, what does it take? And um, really, we uh, have no plans on building any, any new warehouses on the dry side. Um, in, for the next three to four years because of the efficiency gain. So it's really just breaking apart um, processes. Uh, areas of waste, and uh, we call it one one best way. When you have 185 warehouses, you get a little variation as you go around the country. So we're streamlining the communication, streamlining the training, so that we have one way of operating from coast to coast. Jill, can you talk about how you're preparing for the next correction? Um, well, one thing, uh, the next correction actually typically helps us in the canned seafood business because uh, when things are going great, people are out eating at restaurants and not eating canned tuna. So um, our business gets better <laughs> during those cycles. <laughs> or if a disaster strikes, a hurricane. Silver lining. <laughs> Silver lining, glass half full there. Um, but one thing that we are doing, I would say specifically at corporate headquarters, is we're really trying to streamline everything that we do and, and questioning and how can we, uh, you know, work collaborative, collaboratively across our different departments? How can we streamline things, eliminate waste? Um, we're really just trying to get smarter and faster and more efficient. So I would say that that's one of the things that we're doing as well as, you know, working with our partners on how can we be better together. Again, in the warehouses, how can we um, work with our customers so that their orders are more efficient? And how can we 
deliver better to our customers as well. Thank you. Mark. Yeah, we're uh, expanding the use of robotic process automation and AI tools and machine learning tools so that we can be more efficient, right, do more with less. So as we grow the top line, we're not having to add as many people. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the, um, on the trucking side, you know, we own a company, Penske Truck Leasing, our parent company. Um, they, they manage their fleet very, very well. They have a, a commercial rental fleet of about 21,000 to 20,500 Class 8 tractors. And last year at this time, that fleet saw a utilization of about 93%, 92 to 93%. So that's a leading indicator for us, right? So today, that same fleet is seeing utilization of about 80, 87, 88%. So we're really trying to manage that fleet, right-sizing it, bringing it down by about 4,000 units. We're going to convert some units into full-service lease, and then we're going to sell some older units. So that's key to us, but it does show us that the economy is starting to slow. Is that, that's how we look at it. Okay. Derek, you're going to be ready? Um, yeah, we think so. Uh, we spent most of 18 um, kind of with a strategy internally we referred to as beyond the rate, meaning everybody was out talking rate and taking rate, and rate was, if you, if you allowed it to be, would be the only thing you focused on, and that's just one metric. And so we wanted to do all of the other things that we thought made sense, like continuing to grow and diversify our portfolios. So we had goals out there to grow our logistics business by greater than 20%, and we did that. We wanted to get up to 60% of our fleet and dedicated, which is much more um, cycle-proof, if you will, um, than the one-way truckload is. We got to 57%, and we're still working towards 60 uh, we did a ton of work along this alignment of, with winners because everybody kind of wakes up and reads the news and believes retail's dead, and, and I believe that that's just not true. They're dead retailers all over the place, but retail's not dead. And so if you align yourself with winning formulas and winning companies um, and work aggressively in a market like 18 to do that, you're going to be better served in 19 and 20 if, in fact, we end up in a recession. And then lastly, I'm probably a little more optimistic than some on – um, the fact that this economy is, is changing and different than what we've historically seen. And I don't think just because we hit 10 years, there's a foregone conclusion. You know, wages are up, unemployment is down, the manufacturing index is still relatively stable. Yes, there's some trouble on housing and, and automotive in terms of starts and builds. But I, I think there's still, you know, from a macro perspective, some opportunity for, you know, 19 to play out better than people may be thinking and 20 to hold up even better um, than most projections currently have it. But we'll see. Time will tell. Steve, you've either been struck with some kind of palsy or you were nodding in agreement. Well, I, I was agreeing with what he was, what he was saying. And, and we, we are of the, the good fortune that we serve a lot of different markets. And so, so those markets uh, have a tendency to, to seldom move in the same direction at the same time. But it is certain, as we look at the markets that we serve, that we're seeing more variability and we're seeing um, things occur faster. And so for us, it's about being more nimble, making sure we're listening to our customers and it, at least we'll know which way they're leaning so we can make adjustments uh, as we go forward. But, but we haven't forgotten about what we have to do in good times, and that is that we have to relentlessly make sure that we are being efficient uh, we have to position ourselves so that we and our customers can compete in the inevitable down cycle that, that every market uh, has. And in, um, in growth years and non-growth years, we have to keep a customer-focused growth mindset that we're building that opportunity pipeline of tomorrow, uh, not just focused on what's in front of us today when we're talking to our customers. And Michael, it seems like a perfect opportunity to wrap it up with 2019 and beyond, an opportunity to break the cycle. Great. Please bring it home. Well, I mean, we were, we were talking about the potential for a recession and, and how uh, shippers and carriers would react to it and would they, would they be ready for it. I think the answer is that um, the reason we struck an optimistic tone in the report is because we've seen this increased collaboration between shippers and carriers, better deployment of, uh, of technology, more awareness, a desire to solve uh, problems together. Um, so I think whatever happens, we're going to see improvements in supply chains. The silver lining in the cloud to build on, to build on what Jill was saying, last year's crisis really brought uh, logistics professionals in shippers to the fore. They got the ear of the CEOs. They're either in the C-suite or they're reporting to the C-suite. And historically, logistics tended to be in shippers, a bit, a bit the tail being wagged by the dog. They would kind of fix everything and maybe dump their problems on the carriers. But when prices shot up 
And um, you know, folks like Jill were able to bring to the C-suite the evidence that you know, there are some structural problems in the industry that we have to address as shippers. That rose the stature of, of logistics within shippers and allowed them to invest more time, effort, and corporate attention in having better relationships with their carriers. So I think there has been a shift in the recognition uh, of the importance of logistics in supply chains, which is going to keep feeding that collaboration and, and bring us better results in supply chains, whatever happens in the economy. Thank you. So with that, we've come up to the noon hour. I, I want to thank CSCMP for continuing this tradition of producing this report. I want to thank Penske for their continued sponsorship. I want to thank A.T. Carney for the outstanding job you've done in pre presenting this report today and over the last few years. Uh, I want to thank you for your continued support and interest in the success of supply chain. And would you please join me in thanking all of our panelists up here.